سيما بقية الله في النار وحجته على الخلائق أجمعين سيدنا وإمام زماننا وولي أمرنا مهدي هذه الأمة وطاووس أهل الجنة الحجة ابن الحسن العسكري فداه وأرواح العالمين اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة تمتعه فيها طويلا اللهم وهب لنا رأفته ورحمته وعونه ودعاه وخيره ورضاه ما ننال به سعة من رحمتك وفوزا عندك يا كريم لرحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين for the hastening of the reappearance of the Master, the Savior, the Avenger, Al Hujjat ibn Al Hasan Al Askari, recite aloud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. My dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. When we attempt to speak about Someone like Ali ibn Abi Talib, we find ourselves standing before an endless ocean that fills the horizon. One is left utterly speechless, clueless, not knowing where to begin and where to end. Which of the virtues of Ali ibn Abi Talib are we meant to cite and to elaborate on? How could we even begin to speak of the virtues of a man that the greatest scholars, the greatest erudites, the most knowledgeable poets have acknowledged their incapacity and have confessed to their inability to speak about him. Ahmad ibn Hanbal is a Sunni scholar, someone who leads an entire juristic school within the Sunni sect. He has a book called Fadail al Sahaba, The Virtues of the Companions. The book is two volumes in length. The first volume is dedicated to mentioning and speaking and narrating about the virtues of the companions of the Messenger of Allah. All of them combined in one volume. The second is dedicated exclusively to Ali ibn Abi Talib. How do we even begin to describe a man like Ali whose virtues were censored? whose merits were filtered. The apparatus of entire governments were employed to ensure that the virtues of Amir al-Mu'mineen were not recorded, they were not transmitted, and they were not preserved for later generations to learn about him. Muawiyah and his kingdom, all of the state employees, 
were used for that purpose, Al Khalil Al Farahidi was the most senior scholar in the city of Basra in the year 150 after the Hijrah. Al Khalil Ibn Ahmed Al Farahidi. The year 150, which is almost 1250 years ago, so close to the Holy Prophet during the time of the Imams, he was once asked the question, speak to us about the virtues of Ali. There was a dispute as to whether Al-Khalil Farahidi was a Shia or not. This set the record straight. He said, what would you like me to say about a man with this quality? He said, أَخْفَى أَعْدَاؤُهُ فَضَائِلَهُ حَسَدًا وَأَخْفَى أَوْلِيَاؤُهُ فَضَائِلَهُ خَوْفًا His enemies try to erase the virtues of this man out of envy and jealousy towards him, out of hatred and animosity. And they employed every tool in their possession to do that. And his friends they also hid his virtues and his merits out of fear of persecution, of imprisonment, of execution. And yet, despite these two elements, where his enemies would hide his merits out of envy and his friends would hide his merits out of fear, فَظَهَرَ بَيْنَ ذَلِكَ مَا يَمْلَأُ الْخَافِقِينَ And yet, despite that, the amount of virtues we have about the character of Ali ibn Abi Talib fills the space between the heaven and earth. How do we even begin speaking about a person like Ali? Once, I'll give you an example from my own experience. I was attending a conference on Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam and science. There have been many conferences, by the way, on this specific subject. Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam is God's proof on earth. He is the vicegerent of the divine. We won't even talk about him. His students and his students' students went on to make incredible contributions to every field of science. And so while I was attending that conference, there were many speeches, many uh, workshops, many papers were presented on this subject. It is so sad, brothers and sisters, that we who call ourselves Ja'fari, we follow the faith of Imam al-Sadiq, we take him as our leader, divinely appointed, Vicegerent of Allah, we don't know much about him. And it takes someone from the East or the West, it takes a non-Muslim to come and say, hey, did you know your Imam said such and such? Anyway, while presenting a topic in one of the uh, workshops at that conference, I mentioned the hadith of Amir al muminin Listen carefully to this. Those of you who are interested in cosmology, astronomy, those who pursue this field or read up on it, you'll find this incredibly eye-opening. I mentioned the hadith in which Amir al muminin speaks about the origin of the universe, which is one of the most sensitive and controversial and consequential subjects in cosmology. How did the universe come about? What happened at the beginning of the process of the universe and its creation? So the hadith is lengthy. I want to mention just one point that the Imam cited. He said that prior to the creation of the universe, all of the contents of the cosmos were crammed and compressed into a dot that was infinitely small. Again, if you are someone who's interested in these subjects, you'll find this to be 
very familiar. This is Ali ibn Abi Talib, 14 centuries ago. This isn't Stephen Hawking's. This isn't modern cosmologists. The Imam says that the entire universe was compressed into a dot that was infinitely small. The Imam says, smaller than the smallest grain of sand, which was a way to provide a means of measurement for the people at the time. Then the Imam said, not only was it infinitely small, but the weight of this dot was the same as the weight of the entire universe today. Allahu Akbar. Which is exactly what contemporary cosmologists and astrophysicists have postulated only in the last 50 or 60 years. And this is what they've been talking about. The Imam said this 14 centuries ago. Now, after we finish the workshop, one of the people who was a co-panelist with me, he was the head of the Department of Quantum Physics at a university in Canada. He came to us. He said, where did you just say the quote that you mentioned? Who is it attributed to? I said, it's attributed to Ali ibn Abi Talib. He said to me, well, I don't know of this man. All I can tell you from what I've just heard is that he was either a god or godly. In other words, he's either someone who possesses so much knowledge about the universe that he was the one who created it, or he has a direct line of connection to the one who created it. They tried to obfuscate the merits of Ali for various reasons as we elaborated. And yet, the world today is mesmerized by Ali. A Christian man, his name's Bulu Salama. He's from Lebanon. He wrote 4,000 verses of poetry about Amir al muminin A Christian man who doesn't believe that the Imam was divinely appointed 4,000 verses. In one of those poems that he wrote about the commander of the faithful, he says, لا تقل شيعة ولاة علي إن في كل منصف شيعية Don't say that Ali has followers who are called Shia and no one follows Ali, no one loves Ali except the Shia. Anyone with a modicum of sincerity and truthfulness will have no choice but to fall in love with Ali. Then he says, جَلْجَلَ الْحَقُّ فِي الْمَسِيحِيِّ حَتَّى صَارَ مِنْ فَرْطِ حُبِّهِ عَلَوِيَّ I can see the truth so manifest, so evident, that despite the fact that I'm a Christian, I am Alawi. I follow and love none other than Ali. Then he says, to wrap it all up, he says, Ya Sama Ushadi, wa ya ardu qarri, wakhshai innani dhakartu aliya. He says, Oh heavens, you should brace yourself. Oh earth, wait, because I'm about to mention the name of Ali. They tried and they tried and they tried. And yet, here we are today, lovers of Ali, admirers of Ali, in the most far-flung places on the planet, gathering to hear his merits and his virtues, to mourn his tragedy, and to cry for his martyrdom. Allahu Akbar. Muawiyah had a cousin. Listen to this. Maybe one of the stories that you haven't heard before. His name was Muhammad ibn Abi Hudayfa. He was Muawiyah's maternal cousin, the son of his aunt. Despite being related by blood to Muawiyah, he was one of the greatest companions of Amir al-Mu'mineen. 
And so because of his love towards the Imam, Muawiyah threw him in prison. It was his own cousin. But this is what hatred does. He threw him in jail. فَبَقِيَ فِي السِّجْنِ دَهْرًا He remained in prison for a lengthy period. God only knows how long. Then, after Amir al-Mu'mineen's martyrdom, Muawiyah said to his friends, he said, let me bring my cousin out, Muhammad ibn Abi Hudayfa, and try and get him to show remorse for expressing allegiance to Ali, my arch nemesis. Let me have a talk with him. Maybe the many years he spent in prison will have changed his mind. And maybe now he regrets what he did. So he summoned him, they brought him from prison. Muawiyah looked at him, he said to him, listen, Ali was my enemy. But that's because Ali had a part to play in the killing of Uthman. And Ali was not a just ruler. Ali was this, Ali was that. And I wish for you to now show some remorse so that I could pardon you. It's been a long time. You've been in these dark dungeons for too long. His cousin, Muhammad ibn Abi Hudayfa, he said to him, Oh Muawiyah, I've known you since before the advent of Islam. I've known you as a child, and I've known you as an adult man. And I can tell you that when Islam came, فَمَا زَادَكَ قَلِيلًا أَوْ كَثِيرًا Islam did not change you the slightest bit. You're still the same scum that you were when we used to play together as children. Muawiyah, you should hear what I have to tell you. The companions of Ali, forget Ali himself, the companions of Ali, the likes of Maytham al-Tammar, the likes of Malik al-Ashtar, the likes of Amr ibn al-Hamiq al-Khuza'i, the companions of Ali are superior to you and all of your armies because they were believers and you're a hypocrite. Allahu Akbar. When the commander of the faithful, I mentioned this parenthetically, when he went to the battle of Safin, the Imam said, Inni a'rifuhum sigaran wa kibaran. I've known these people as children and I know them as adults. And I used to fight these very same flags in the reign of Rasulullah, in the lifetime of the Holy Prophet. It was the same characters, the same people. It was Muawiyah who came with his father Abu Sufyan and led the armies against the Holy Prophet in Badr and Uhud and elsewhere. I'm fighting the same faces. I'm fighting the same individuals. So Muhammad ibn Abi Hudayfa says to him that the companions of Ali are righteous, pious, individuals, and you are nothing but a hypocrite. And my proof for your hypocrisy is the fact that you hate me, your own cousin, your own flesh and blood, because I love Ali ibn Abi Talib. By God, I will forever love Ali and hate you for the sake of God and his messenger. Muawiyah said to him, You're still the same old deviant man. Take him back to prison. When he was walking out, he was heard saying, The words of Prophet Yusuf السلام, who when he was taken to prison, he said to Allah, O oh Lord, Prison is more favored to me. It is better in my eyes than what they call me to. They took him to prison. He stayed there until his death. Until his death. al alamatul amini This is all to illustrate the point about the price that our predecessors had to pay for the preservation of the love of Ali. I say this especially to the younger members of the audience, MashaAllah, we have so many luminous faces, illuminated by the love of Ali ibn Abi Talib. But I want you not to take this love for granted. I want you to fully appreciate 
what it took for you to sit here tonight and to say, Ilahi bi'aliyin, bi'aliyin, bi'aliyin. Al-Allamatu al-Amini, the author of the famous compendium, Al-Ghadir, in which he traces the story of Ghadir in the works and books and testimonies of thousands of Sunni scholars, of hundreds of companions of the Holy Prophet, 10 volumes. This man has another book. The book is called Shuhada al Fadilah, The Martyrs of Virtue. In it, he mentions the stories of scholars as well as regular individuals, true believers who were killed for their love of Ali ibn Abi Talib. I don't think there is any other religion out there. There is any other ethnic group. There is any other denomination that has had to give so much blood just to be able to worship, just to be able to preserve their legacy and their beliefs. They talk about anti-Semitism as being the oldest hatred and the most intense and most unique hatred. Well, I posit that the most unique hatred is the one that was exhibited against Ali ibn Abi Talib and his followers. Rivers of blood had to be shed so that the name of Ali would still echo throughout the millennia. Al-Allamatu al-Amini in this book mentions many stories. One of them is the story of Qadi Nurullah Tustari. Those from the Indian subcontinent, in particular, those from India will recognize this name. Who is this man? He's often referred to as a shaheed al-Thalith, the third martyr, after a shaheed al-Awwal and shaheed al-Thani, who were from Jabal Amil from Lebanon. Qadi Nurullah Tustari was the third martyr. His story in a nutshell is that he went to India and while there he became such a prominent scholar that all of the Sunni scholars of the day became envious towards him. The king of the time told him that you cannot teach the Ja'fari fiqh, the jurisprudence of the Shia faith. You're only permitted to teach Sunni fiqh, from the four Sunni juristic schools of thought. Qadi Nurullah Tustari says, fine, I will do exactly that. So he began teaching Shi'i fiqh using references from the four Sunni schools. Imagine your prowess, your acumen, your incredible command of fiqh for you to be able to do that. And so he did that for a long time, but the envy was boiling in his contemporaries, in his adversaries, who didn't like the fact that this scholar was gaining more and more prominence and subvertly teaching the hadith of Imam al-Baqir and Imam al-Sadiq. And so they went to the king of his day, Shah Jahangir, who was a weak man. He was easily swayed and influenced by others. They went to him. They said, did you know this person is a Shia? He said, do you have any proof? They said, we'll get you the proof. Because he was in dissimulation. He was practicing taqiyya. So they inserted an individual who was a spy to pretend like he was his student. And so being a student, he spent a lot of time with Qadi Nurullah. He was with him in the day and the night, learning from him. And so Qadi Nurullah Tustari confided in him that I am indeed a Shia. This treasonous, treacherous student then stole one of the most monumental works of Qadi Nurullah called Ihqaq al-Haq wa Ibtal al-Batil. It's a work of 19 volumes in which he establishes the 
superiority of Amir al muminin over everybody else. 19 volumes. Al-Allama al-Majlisi, Salamullahi alayhi, the author of Bihar al-Anwar, he says that every Shia has to possess this book and read this book and study this book. Once again, I said something a few nights ago, I will reiterate and emphasize it yet again. Brothers, sisters, read, study, learn, try and bolster your spiritual and intellectual immune systems so that you don't fall for any charlatan that comes your way. So that you're not deceived by any random person who comes and tells you that your faith is this, your religion is that, or worse still, say that I am the Mahdi, I am the representative of the Imam, and I want to extract your allegiance. You must become intellectually strong and robust so that you don't fall for these deceptions. Don't be content with attending the majlis once or twice a year. I find it incredibly beautiful to see so many people in attendance tonight. But this cannot just become a seasonal thing. The Husayniya, the Masjid, these great institutions are provided as safe havens for you to come and learn and ask the scholars if you have any questions. The hadith says, and I've quoted this in previous lectures, the Imam says, Inna nas, people perish la because they don't ask, because they don't inquire, because they don't try to increase their knowledge. Anyway, Allama al Majlisi says that this book must be read and studied by every Shia. And it was authored by Qadi Nurullah to study. That spy stole a copy of the book and brought it to the king. All of the Sunni scholars came and they said, here is your definitive proof that this man is a Shia in disguise. So they brought Qadi Nurullah. The king said to him, while all of these sheikhs, all of these so-called imams were in attendance, he said to him, are you a Shia? Speak the truth. He said, of course I'm a Shia. Who else would I give my allegiance to than Ali ibn Abi Talib? Who else? Bring me someone who's better than Ali ibn Abi Talib in any one of his virtues. Anything. I challenge you. Of course, I'm a follower of Ali. I'm proud to say that I'm but a small, tiny slave of Ali ibn Abi Talib. So... Shah Jahangir ordered for him to be tortured. Allahu Akbar. Not just to be executed, not to be imprisoned, but to be tortured. They began lashing him, historians say, to the point where his skin and flesh started to fall down. And even then they weren't content. At the end, they got a pot of molten iron. They poured it over his head and killed him. Brothers and sisters, so many sacrifices had to be made so that the legacy of Ali ibn Abi Talib would reach us and it is critical that we try and show some appreciation. Imam al-Hadi alayhi salam has a beautiful devotional text what we refer to as ziyarah. It's often referred to as ziyaratul ghadiriya. When Imam al Hadi was summoned to Samarra on his way from Medina to the north of Iraq, the Imam passed through the holy city of Najaf. He stood there in front of the shrine of Ali ibn Abi Talib on the day of Ghadir. And he recited this ziyarah, which if you read it rather slowly, it takes about an hour and a half to finish. In that ziyarah, Imam al-Hadi addresses Amir al muminin He says to him, Salawatullahi alayk ghaidatan wa ra'iha. Ya Amir al muminin May God's blessings be upon you. Then he begins to list some of the merits of Ali. 
in particular those that have a Quranic reference. He mentions the verses and he mentions their connection to Amir al Mu'mineen. Then at the end, Imam al Hadi says, But how can someone like me speak of your virtues, O oh Ali? Imam al Hadi, an infallible Imam. He says, I cannot even begin to speak of your merits. Then he says, The only one capable of mentioning and illustrating your infinite virtues is none other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is Imam al Hadi. My brothers and sisters, I don't wish to take too much of your time. Tonight is a truly special occasion. It is the night in which this gem, this incomparable, precious individual was taken from us. Imam al-Rida speaks about Amir al-Mu'mineen. He says, Wahidu You are the only one in all of history. History became barren and infertile and could never give birth to anyone like you. It's a very special night. It's also a night, the first night of Qadr, the night of destiny. And so the correlation between Amir al Mu'mineen and the night of destiny, in which our primary objective is to apologize to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is to ask God for forgiveness. An entire year has passed. We've committed so many sins. I'm speaking about myself. So many sins, so many transgressions, so many acts of wrongdoing, so many hurtful things we've said to others, so many acts of oppression against us, against ourselves. And yet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was generous enough and merciful enough and affectionate enough to give me yet another chance to allow me the opportunity to attend these gatherings that are being held across the globe so that we could come and ask Allah in the name of Ali ibn Abi Talib to forgive us. Amir al muminin is truly unique. <coughs> I'll mention a couple more hadith and then try and wrap up the majlis. Sallu ala Muhammad wa alayhi One day, a group of so-called companions, I won't mention their names, they came to the Holy Prophet. They said to him, Ya Rasulullah, ما بالك تفضل علينا عليا في كل حال ولا ترى لنا فضلا دونه O Messenger of God, why do you put Ali ahead of us at all times? Why do you praise him more than you praise anybody else? You don't see that we have any virtues, we don't have any merits. Why is it always Ali, 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 Ali? Why? Let me mention something here before I continue the hadith. When it comes to the love of Ali, there are two distinct groups of people. The first group are like you and I. May Allah keep us in this category and in this group. We are delighted when we hear the very name of Ali, don't we? فَمَا أَحْلَى أَسْمَاءَكُمْ We love hearing about his virtues. We enjoy hearing about his merits. This is one group. The group that doesn't complain to Rasulullah. Why do you keep speaking about Ali? In this group, we have people who say, Amiri Husseinun wa ni'mal Amir. Sururu Fuad al Bashir al Nadir. My master is Ali. Shouldn't I enjoy hearing about him? He is my leader. If there is anyone worthy of being loved, it is Ali and the family of Ali. So you have this group. Then you have another group whose hearts tremble. 
and are filled with hypocrisy whenever they hear the name of Ali. In this group, you have people who hate the Imam so much, they don't even want to hear his name, let alone his virtues. These are people who come to Rasulullah and say, what's wrong with you, essentially? That's what they're, they're telling the Prophet. Stop it, enough. We don't want to hear about Ali anymore. Why do we have these two groups? Because God made Ali the litmus test. Those of you who have done chemistry in high school will know what a litmus test is. He is the litmus test of people with faith being distinguished from people of hypocrisy. Ya Ali, la yuhibbuka illa mu'min, wa la yubghiduka illa munafiq. Aw waladu zina. Oh Ali, only a true believer loves you. Why? Because you see, all of the great virtues of humanity personified in Ali. Talk about generosity, and you see the generosity in action when you examine the life of Ali. Talk about compassion, and you see it epitomized in Ali. Talk about bravery, and inshallah we'll talk about the bravery of Amir al-Mu'mineen in the next few nights. We will examine the battles of Khandaq and Ahzab and others from a different lens. We will mention things you probably never heard before. Talk about bravery. And Ali's name is the first that pops in your head. Talk about any great virtue. That is why Christians fall head over heels in love with him. That is why non-believers of every creed and every color can't help but love Ali. But then you have people who are hypocrites. A hypocrite despises Ali ibn Abi Talib. Number one, because Allah made it so. That Ali is the litmus test. Number two, because a hypocrite can't bear to hear virtues being given to someone else. Hypocrites are arrogant. They possess incredible Hubris, they want virtues to be associated with them, not with Ali ibn Abi Talib. Anyway, this group came to the Holy Prophet. They said to him, could you stop talking about the merits of your cousin? Don't any one of us have any virtues? Is it all Ali, Ali? The Prophet responded with one statement. He said, Ma ana fadhaltuh. I am not the one who made him superior to you. It is God Himself who made him superior. <laughs> For the love of Ali ibn Abi Talib, another stout. <laughs> to receive the intercession of Amir al-Mu'mineen on the Day of Judgment, another louder salawat. Allah. 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 <coughs> One day, <coughs> the Holy Prophet was sitting in the masjid with many of his companions. The Holy Prophet said that a man is about to walk through the door of the masjid who is among the people of paradise. The Prophet didn't do this very often. It's a very rare occasion that Rasulullah would give someone a guarantee of going to paradise. I know that the other school has al-ashr al-mubashara bil-jannah. But we all know that's a fabricated concoction. The people on that list fought each other, killed each other. It makes no sense for all of them to be in paradise. Rasulullah instead would on very rare occasions identify someone and say that this person is definitely going to paradise. In other words, the Prophet knows that this individual is not only faithful now, 
but will maintain their faith until the day they die. So imagine all of the companions are sitting, waiting to see who this man is. He's a man of paradise. Surely he's special. The hadith is mentioned in many, many different sources, including in Sunni sources. They say that a man walked in, but hardly anyone recognized him. A Bedouin man, someone who wasn't from Medina, from outside the city. He walked in. Rasulullah said, that's the man. He is from the people of paradise, min ahl al-jannah. So they said to Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, why is this man going to paradise for certain? Rasulullah said, لِأَنَّهُ يُحِبُّ هَذَا because he's one of the followers and lovers of this man. If you love Ali, you will go to paradise. If you maintain that love, if you fulfill your obligations towards Ali, you will go to paradise. The Prophet said, because he loves Ali, he will enter paradise. The hadith says that the man came, he prayed, then he left the, mas the masjid. Umar ran after him. Umar and Abu Bakr. They all ran after him. They went to him. They said, could we shake your hand? He's a celebrity now. He's going to paradise. The Prophet's given him a guarantee, a blank check. Could we shake your hand? Could we embrace you? Could we kiss you? He looked at them. He said, Waylakum, woe unto you. The Prophet just told you the reason I'm going to paradise is because I love Ali ibn Abi Talib. Go straight to the source. Go to Ali. You want to be like me? Simply love Ali ibn Abi Talib. What is wrong with you? Allahu Akbar. Traditions tell us that that man was none other than Malik ibn Nuwayrah. This hero who maintained his allegiance to Ali ibn Abi Talib until the death of the Holy Prophet and the appointment of the self-proclaimed Khalifa and the first person to be killed was Malik ibn Nuwayr. They harbored this hatred towards him that after the Holy Prophet, they sent a contingency headed by Khalid ibn Walid who killed Malik ibn Nuwayr. He raped his wife. He committed atrocities that I can't even begin to list because he was the one identified by Rasulullah as the one entering paradise. My brothers and sisters, Amir al muminin is our gateway towards the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At the time of the Holy Prophet, if anyone has any qualms or doubts about this, why don't we go straight to Allah? Because Allah Himself has said, وَابْتَغُوا إِلَيْهِ الْوَسِيلَةِ Who am I? To stand before Allah filled with sins from head to toe and ask him for forgiveness. I have to take Rasulullah with me and present him between me and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says in the Quran, Ja'uk, Fastaghfarullah wa astaghfar lahum al Rasul. When they commit sins, they should come to you, Ya Rasulullah. Allah could have said that they should come to me and seek my forgiveness directly. But no, in the Quran, Allah says, أَنفُسَهُمْ When they commit injustice against themselves, جَاءُوك, they came to you. فَاسْتَغْفَرُ اللَّهُ Then they seek forgiveness. وَاسْتَغْفَرَ لَهُمُ الرَّسُولُ And the Prophet also seeks forgiveness for them. لَوَجَدُوا اللَّهَ تَوَّابًا رَحِيمًا We say, Ya Rasulullah, you also would ask Allah in the name of Ali ibn Abi Talib. There is a hadith which says that Amir al-Mu'mineen came to the Holy Prophet. He said to him, Ya Rasulullah, pray for me. 